There's no introduction. He was one of the uh, driving forces behind Fodzi, although he claims no responsibility for the name. <laughs> um, Mike's also one of the, the leaders of the research theme on economics and learning, and that's uh, what he's going to be telling us about this morning. Mike. All right. Thanks, Peter. And a uh, pleasure to see all of you. I wish we were in person, but um, that'll happen someday. So let me do a little share screen here. I'm getting actually good at Zoom. That's the one thing I've gotten out of this whole period. Um, I should not say that. It'll, it'll jinx me, however. All right. So, okay. So let me just first of all say that um, I'm no expert on microeconomics. Why am I talking about it? Um, well, because every 10 years I like to work on complete something completely different that I've never worked on before. And um, so in this case, it's, it's going to be blends of micro, microeconomics with machine learning. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I, I, there's a lot of people that already know a lot more about me, and that's always an opportunity for me to learn things and to see if I can uh, contribute in some way. So let me just uh, acknowledge some collaborators here, uh, either past or future or present. Um, got a team uh, spanning uh, Berkeley and MIT. I think this team will grow over time. It probably has already grown. Um, so let me not go through the details on this slide. Just uh, you can see, I guess, uh, someone else prepared this slide. I guess there's the prisoner's dilemma up there in the upper right. Uh, but let me sit, make a few kind of uh, possibly slightly provocative comments about game theory, mechanism design, machine learning, statistics, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, I don't think that these kind of blends that we're talking about are, are new in any real way. In fact, I, I like to uh, point to David Blackwell as a person who is equally comfortable in economics and statistics and uh, algorithms. Um, and, you know, Wald and others, even, even before Blackwell, uh, you know, span these fields. So I think Wevis is kind of trying to uh, re-energize and uh, innovate in, in the kind of paths that they have already taken uh, for modern reasons and using some, some newer tools. Uh, so anyway, let me uh, caricaturize a little bit game theory mechanism design. Um, classically, the focus has been on prior knowledge. You assume that either all the preferences are known in some sort of a game or perhaps that the distributions are known. And particularly if you don't know the distributions, it's hard to, hard to say much of anything. Uh, so a lot of the field has, uh, especially mechanism design, revolved around Bayesian assumptions, where I assume I know the, the priors for everybody, and then I uh, derive some consequences for that about, for example, what bids I might make um, or, or what matchings I might prefer and, and so on. Um, so you have to assume, assume that lots, are, lots of things are known. Um, and uh, this doesn't really accord very well with the modern world where we might have uh, hundreds of millions of entities, uh, either agents or, uh, or products or items or something. Um, and there's no way that you're gonna have known preferences over all those things. You have to somehow experience them. And so there's got to be more of a focus on learning. And of course the word learning appears in microeconomics, but um, it's, it's a bit of a limited uh, usage. It's really repeated experience with the game. Um, the notion of learning uh, statistically and making models of agents and, and uh, model, models of uh, interactions is, is somehow less present. And I think that's where many of the opportunities lie. And of course, I'm not alone in, in asserting this. Uh, a lot of the work in the EC field has, has kind of moved in this direction from just pure algorithm of game theory to kind of data-informed algorithm game theory. Um, Okay, so I might add that I do have a lot of respect for econometrics. It's been the area that where statistics has interfaced with economics, um, but largely it's been about just the measurement problem. You know, how do we feed, you know, especially with macroeconomics, how do we feed, how do we verify assumptions and measure things? Um, and we want to do something much more ambitious, uh, really having, you know, lear learning and data analysis kind of agents embedded in, in game theory. Um, now, on the other side of the coin is where, the, where I'm a little more familiar. Um, let's think about machine learning and think about how much embrace it has had of microeconomics. And I'd say very little, and particularly the latest wave of hype and, and you know, activity on machine learning has all been a bit about pattern recognition and sort of no focus really on decision making. Um, and so you could be uh, you know, excused by thinking that, well, decisions are just, that's a threshold of a neural network, isn't it? Um, and, you know, that's just not a very helpful way to think um, in, in, in non-consequential problems, like is there a bunny in the image or something, maybe. Um, but if it's like, um, you know, doctor measure all kinds of things about my body and my genome and so on, tell me whether I'm about to have a heart attack, you know, or should I have an operation, that's a consequential decision. And it's not just a threshold, you're going to have a dialogue with the doctor, you're going to consider various counterfactuals. You're going to think about the provenance of the data, how relevant is the data to what my current decision is. And you're going to bring new perspectives on your decision 
that will come out in part of the dialogue, kind of much more like an economics uh, kind of thinking, uh, you know, involve a decision in economics involves thinking through things. Um, uh, moreover, you're never going to just have one decision. You're almost always going to have sets of decisions, and they'll probably be across a network involving other people. Uh, you're going to have to worry about the overall errors over the entire set. So things like false discovery rate really need to take over from things like precision recall accuracy, where the pattern recognition people are focused. Then you have them over time. And I don't just mean, uh, you know, we introduce a time axis. I mean, over long stretches of time, maybe years, you know, decisions were going to, you know, the data was collected 10 years ago, but it's still relevant, maybe. Uh, if I can kind of think about that. Um, and so there's asynchronous, there's different time scales. And then particularly for the purpose of this talk, there's decisions when there's scarcity and competition. And so this uh, has not been the focus of much of machine learning. People just haven't worried about it. They've just you know done the optimal quote unquote decision or maybe the optimal sequence in a reinforcement learning paradigm. But they've rarely thought about how does that interact with uh, you know other decisions that might be made when there's scarcity. Uh, so there is a bit of work on multi-agent RL. Um, you know, but I'm, I, I think there's a lot still to do there. I don't think that field is very mature at this point. Um, so my, one of the sort of thought experiments I've done to help me get thinking about these issues is just to consider classical recommendation systems. So these are pattern recognition systems. They, they're not really decision-making systems per se. Um, so they look for patterns in data, you know, and you know what they are. We have customers making purchases. You kind of cluster purchases or customers or both. Um, and you make recommendations of new things that a customer may wish to purchase. Um, so it's become a commodity. You can download software to do it and people just roll it out in various new kinds of domains. Um, now for domains like books and movies, it just, it's not, not unreasonable. A lot of us use it, you know, Amazon and other places, it's been very effective. Um, but as soon as you start to you use it in a wider range of domains where there really is scarcity, you run into some sort of obvious but non-trivial problems. Um, so consider that, you know, Amazon recommends, you know, to maybe a million people a day, you know, books or, or, or movies or some other entities, uh, you know, it's very likely they'll recommend the same book or movie to, you know, 100,000 people in a given day, just because it's popular or for, or just plus on statistics, right? And that's fine in that domain. There's no scarcity. You can copy the book or the movie all as many times as you want. But if you recommend, say, uh, you say you build a recommendation system to recommend restaurants to people, um, if it's just some web app and no one's really using it, it's, it's fine. Um, but if it's really real consequential uh, app, you know, in other words, everyone in the city is really using it, um, you know, then people are going to punch the button to try to get recommendations. And there's a good chance that, you know, 10,000 people will be recommended the same restaurant. And now you're sort of stuck. Either you can say, well, that's a load balancing problem. I just got to kind of, you know, randomly choose or something. Um, or you, you got to know a lot about the people, um, you know, kind of like, oh, I, I know their browser history. So I know so much about them. I can figure out which restaurant they want to go to. And I think you can see that those are both kind of ridiculous perspectives. Uh, unfortunately, they're kind of common in the IT industry. Um, and a much more reasonable perspective is to think about this like an economics person would and say, oh, well, I need to create a market. I've got to, um, you know, um, make, make a market happen. And it's a very large scale market. There might be, you know, 100,000 restaurants in, you know, in some, in, in Shanghai, and you don't know which one you want to go to. Um, and it might be 100 million people, you know, thinking they would like to go to a restaurant. Um, same kind of things happens when you recommend streets to drivers. If very few people are using it, it's fine. But as soon as you really roll it out in the real world, a lot of people are using it, you'll create congestion. And so then you got to worry about, well, who should go down which street? Where should I put people so I don't create congestion? And again, if you do that top down uh, or randomly, you're going to leave a lot of economic value on the table because some people are in a hurry and other people are not in a hurry. And you really need to let that kind of utility come into the decision making of this machine learning system. All right. Um, OK, so, um, you know, it's kind of obvious what you should be doing here. You don't just create a recommendation system. You create a two way market to increase producers, consumers. Now, you might have recommendations on both sides of that market. All right, customers that have gone into certain restaurants, um, there's 100,000 restaurants. There's no way I will have a preference over all of them, but maybe my friends have been to lots of them and their recommendations can inform my preferences and I don't have to explore all those options. And I can build a, a, a healthier, more efficient market if I'm using recommendation systems. And that can happen on the um, uh, producer side of the market as well. All right, so the argument here is that you just bring in some mechanism design and, and game theory but it's not just classical microeconomics because we have um, large numbers of entities and we have experiences and we have kind of bandit problems emerging here where you're trying out alternatives and seeing what works 
And that's what's informing the, the ongoing game. All right, so that's kind of, you know, it's a trivial problem at some level, but it's a, I hope you see kind of an ambitious blend to figure out how to design these systems, how to prove things about them, how to investigate robustness and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide. Um, all right, so here's just a few problems. Uh, you know, Costas and I kind of talked a bit and here's some of the ones we wrote down. Um, you know, so multi-way markets in which individual agents need to explore to learn their preferences. I've already kind of alluded to that. Large scale multi-way markets in which agents view other sides of the market via recommendation systems, not just directly, but via recommendations. You know, issues around information sharing, free riding, signaling kind of things. How do you uh, learn by what other people are telling you and how do you put that in, in a, in a uh, you know, competitive context or a cooperative context? You know, auctions in which preferences are learned, incentive aware classification and evaluation, and uh, fairness, privacy, and social good. Often these are talked about separately from an economics perspective. You know, I just, I have a neural net, it should be fair. It should, you know, match the marginal probabilities or something. Um, and, you know, my perspective is that that's fine, but it's just way too limited that you need some notion of economics here. There should be trade-offs and utilities coming into play when you talk about fairness. Uh, and also for privacy. I, I don't have an infinite need for privacy in all problems. Privacy varies depending on other value I may get out of letting data uh, be revealed. So the goal then is more broadly even is to discover new principles that are allowed to, that allow us to build healthy, for example, fair learning based markets that are stabilized over long stretches of time. And this would be a longer talk, but I really want to emphasize this long stretch of time issue. Uh, again, to criticize machine learning, it's kind of like you gather a huge data set and for that one day, it kind of works. Um, but the next day things may have changed and you have to gather a new data set and you have to worry about distribution shift and so on and so forth. And just compare and contrast to markets, which can work for you know decades or centuries. Uh, and they sort of adjust uh, and heal themselves on the fly a little bit more. Um, now, of course, markets have all kinds of problems and all kinds of issues and, and they're not just solved problem. Um, you know, but they do have other properties that are that are valuable that machine learning just doesn't seem to have as easily and naturally. And so the blend um, seems to me extremely well motivated. Um, and of course, you're going to need new kinds of markets, um, you know, just like kind of new kinds of VCG mechanisms were explored where people started to look at, you know, uh, you know, for example, ad placement. Um, we're going to need all kinds of new market principles to, to, to blend really effectively with machine learning. And so there's just huge uh, opportunities here. This is a slide from Costas, actually, and let me just click there, um, which is to get a little more into the uh, machine underlying all of this. What kind of algorithms are we, are we going to be talking about uh, as we start to explore this thing and, and you know, start to develop theory and so on? And um, um, this is a, a useful thesis to consider that minimization has been surprisingly you know, important for current machine learning or AI. Um, uh, and so min-max optimization is, is what's needed to, you know, to go beyond that. It's one of the things that's needed to go beyond that. Or equilibrium learning, if you will. Fi having multiple agents that all are following some gradient algorithm, perhaps, of some kind, and the overall uh, system uh, works effectively. Um, so this is you know, challenging. We have these uh, you know, conflicting aligned interests, and we got to work all that out. We may have adversaries. We may have constraints. Um, and just even basic uh, gradient descent itself uh, doesn't actually converge. Um, so just even the simplest possible algorithm, which you know, kind of works for minimization, doesn't work here. And you already have to do some extra work right from the get-go. Um, this is also a slide that I, that I uh, borrowed from Costas, um, just uh, uh, following up a bit on that point that um, one of the oh, really still open problems is to identify gradient based or, or other similarly lightweight methods, maybe not using Hessians or maybe using Hessians or, or something else uh, that allow you to find equilibrium games. And these don't have just to be Nash equilibria. They can be, uh, you know, sequential or Stackelberg equilibria or other kinds. And they're in fact probably more relevant to the problems we're interested in. <clears throat> All right. So that's just a big class of problems that are as open as, you know, 10 years ago, kind of accelerated gradient was open. Um, now, you know, a baby version of this, which is still quite open, is just, just look at two player zero sum games and you've got now high dimensional X and Y and you maybe have non-convex and non-concave F. Um, so just a few pieces of recent progress on these topics. Um, in fact, uh, Costas and I have a paper with Yelena Diakonikolis um, uh, finding families of non-convex, non-concave uh, functions where uh, gradient descent and ascent actually does is provably uh, works and works efficiently. 
Okay, so um, and coming up from the bottom and, and getting rid of some of the really bad cases that uh, kind of make the general theorem not very uh, useful, but um, uh, focus on some on more tractable models. Um, and uh, then Costas has a line of work uh, with other with colleagues uh, looking at where GDA succeeds. Um, you, know, you know, again, kind of exploiting various forms of structure. Um, and then as well, kind of lower bounds for these kind of classes of problems. Anyway, so lots and lots to do there. Not, not enough people are working on, on these things. Um, in my second half of the, of the presentation, I'm going to um, just mention one particular project I've been doing with Lydia Liu and Horia Mania, grad students working here at Berkeley, um, which, uh, again, it's a very simple problem, very simple setup. So I think it's great for an in introductory talk. It just brings together one learning problem with one microeconomics problem and sort of looks at what starts to happen when you put the two together. Um, you know, not entirely novel, things like this have been looked at, but um, you know, the new, new tools are being used here. Um, so multi-arm bandits are my favorite version of learning problem. Um, supervised learning is all well and good, but you're being kind of told the answer in supervised learning. That's not really kind of learning in some sense. Um, multi-arm bandits are no one's telling you the answer and you've got to learn what's the right thing to do. Um, and so you have to explore and then you want to exploit while you're exploring. And so you all know the setup, you pull an arm, you get a reward, there's some unknown reward distribution. You don't want to find the distribution, but you want to you know, find enough about the distribution so it guides you in, in making good choices. All right. And you perhaps know that um, there's a number of algorithms that do this pretty effectively. Uh, UCB uh, algorithm um, is uh, you know, simple and, and it's a frequentist algorithm. It's an analyzed with frequentist tools, particularly use confidence intervals. And you put a confidence interval around the reward, the mean reward for each of the arms. Okay, so you're not getting the whole distribution, just a confidence interval for the mean reward. And then you pick the upper confidence bound uh, to decide which action to pick next. And so there's, you either pick that because it has already a high reward and the bound, the, you know, the confidence interval is straddling the mean and it's high or because it's high because you have a very wide confidence bound and you don't, uh, you have too much uncertainty about that arm, so you should pick it to reduce your uncertainty. So those two ideas are embodied in one algorithm. And as you may know, um, if you analyze the regret to this algorithm, um, you, you get logarithmic regret um, or square root under certain different kinds of assumptions, but if, you know, uh, sublinear regret, it learns. Um, Okay, so that's on the learning side. On the microeconomic side, let's look at matching markets. You know, Gale, Shapley, uh, Roth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so as all of you know, you have buyers on one side, sellers on the other, and you assume that preferences are known here. So, you know, um, buyer number one prefers seller one to seller three and prefers seller three to seller two um, and so on. So we have on both sides of the market, we have preferences known. Um, and then we'd like to find a matching. And uh, as you probably all know, uh, there's, there's various algorithms, Gale and Shapley's algorithm um, um, runs from the buyer side, makes offers uh, or makes, you know, proposes matches and, um, um, and that yields a match, which is a stable matching. Um, okay, and it's an efficient algorithm that does this and it's a simple, you know, easy to understand algorithm. Okay, so the, uh, a clear research project that has a little bit of the flavor of things I was talking about earlier, like you know, large scale um, um, recommendation systems, uh, is to put matching markets together with bandit learning. Okay, so in other words, what if uh, you don't know those preferences? So I've got to start to explore the other side of the market and figure out which of the entities over there I like, um, and then hopefully start to get matched to those entities via a um, you know Gale Shapley type algorithm. Okay. Um, so now each one of the participants has an exploration exploitation problem. They want to hone in on the arms that looks the best for them, and they don't know a priori which those are, so they have to they have to explore. But there's the other agents which are exploring as well, and that's going to obviously interact with each agent, and that may uh, help my exploration process or it may hinder it. And we want to model those sorts of things. All right, so here's a little picture: uh, two agents, uh, a human and a bear, and they're both picking arms. And the question kind of comes down to what happens when both agents pick the same arm. So in our model, which is a little different than what has been looked at in the classical literature, classical literature was a kind of congestion channel um, you know, for packets on the internet um, or wireless. Uh, so if two agents would pick the same channel, then neither of them would get the channel. You know, you'd put noise into the channel. Here, we assume uh, more of an economic model where uh, if two agents pick the same arm, one of them gets the reward, the other gets a zero. 
of course, they know they get they they did not get the reward. Um, so uh, who gets the reward? Well, um, the uh, arms have also preferences back on the agents, and those are unknown and perhaps stochastic. Um, and uh, so the learners are figuring out that I like arm two, but I see when I pick arm two, it seems like arm two prefers the bear. And so the human will say, well, I better start exploring the other arms more than I otherwise would. So in this model, it seems likely you're going to pay an exploration penalty, um, a necessary one for, by the presence of the other agents in the problem. All right. So our model then is we have a bandit market, agents on one side, arms on the other. And um, when multiple arms pull the same, agents pull the same arm, only one of them gets the reward. Uh, so now to start to do some uh, some theory here, you need to define a natural you know, criterion, uh, some form of regret. Um, so what we've done in our, in our first uh, line of work is to, is to um, uh, take the mean reward of a stable match. So kind of imagine you ran Gail Shapley on known preferences. Um, uh, if that were the case, uh, then you'd get a match. And um, let's suppose you did that on all of the end trials, um, that would give you that first term in the regret there. So we compare our actual reward received to that. So mean reward of a stable match. Um, and we've analyzed a, an algorithm. Um, we've analyzed several algorithms, but let me just mention this first one. Uh, let's call this Gale Shapley upper confidence bound. So this one is actually a centralized algorithm. Um, uh, so here, agents just rank arms like they usually do. They form an upper confidence bound for each arm, and they start to learn which arm they'd like to pick, uh, but they don't get to just pick the arm. They submit these rankings. They submit the upper confidence bound to a matching platform. So they don't uh, uh, um, submit a mean reward. They, they submit an upper confidence bound, and then Gail Shapley runs on the, on the UCB values. It returns a matching, and then you're allowed to experience the reward from the arm that you've been matched to. Okay, so that's our algorithm. And we are able to analyze that and find out that, in fact, you do achieve a logarithmic regret here. Um, so that's up in the numerator and the denominator. There's a term delta, which we have an expression for, which is a, a, a form of reward gap. And it depends on the presence of the other agents. So again, if the bear is picking the same arm that I seem like, like I want to pick, that, that gives me a, a gap, a difference, but not just between the arms, but also between the agents and I'm gonna pay a penalty, uh, I'll have larger regret because of that happening. Um, also, the last bullet on the slide is important. It turns out that this algorithm is incentive compatible. Um, so meaning that if everyone else is playing GSUCB, I am not. I am incentivized to play GSUCB as well. I'm not incentivized to move away and play some other algorithm. Um, okay, uh, last few minutes, and I, I think I'll close a little bit early. I, if I remember, I have 30 minutes, um, so. Um, uh, so we've been working for the last, that paper is about a year old. Um, we've been working for the last year on decentralized models. Um, and I have you know, three separate projects in my group, all decentralized working on this problem. And we have three papers coming out, which all are all different. Um, but I'm gonna mention the one that follows on with work with Lydia and Horia. And we've added um, uh, Feng Ruan to the group as well. Um, but the other ones are a little different and also interesting. And so you'll, you, you'll find them on my publications page. Um, so um, anyway, it's a more challenging problem. And um, I, I don't think there's an, you know, necessarily an obvious best solution here yet, at least. So anyway, the decentralized setting is that players don't communicate with each other or with a platform, okay? So kind of the more realistic model I had in mind, which is that you're walking around looking for a restaurant, um, you, know, you may just kind of want to have a local connection between you and the restaurants. Um, so the, the, the model here is that each player is going to pull, attempt to pull an arm and when multiple arms pull the same arm, the most pref preferred arm by the uh, player, by the arm, wins and is matched. So that's like the model I was talking about. And uh, you get a reward if you're matched, otherwise you don't. And you can see the successful matches, but you don't get to see the other player's rewards. Of course, that's an interesting model of itself. If you get to see the other player's rewards, um, there could be kind of an information sharing or free riding kind of thing that could be studied as well, certainly of interest. All right, so this problem is more challenging. There can be conflict cycles that arise uh, among the decentralized players, and this can be costly, so it has to be taken into account. And uh, regret bounds for general preference structures, uh, the ideas that we were using before based on Gail Shapley just don't apply. And so we've had to come up with some new ideas here. And so let me just mention the, uh, 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 the paper that's about ready to come out. We'll finish it within a week or two. 
uh, that, that looks at a random delays version of UCB. So it, con it avoids conflicts with random delays. Uh, so we're trying to keep this as simple as possible so we can both analyze it, plus we might hope that people would actually use it. Uh, so here, uh, players are going to construct a kind of set of plausible arms, a, a, a seed set of arms, by looking at successful matches from the previous time step. Okay. Um, and then independently with the probability P, you're going to attempt the same arm as at time T minus one. Okay, so we're gonna have geometric probabilities. We have a geometrization of the problem going on. And with probability one minus P, we're going to um, attempt the arm in the plausible set with the highest UCB. So we bring in the UCB exploration exploitation uh, probabilistically. And then you received arms from matched arms and update their UCB. Okay, so it's a pretty simple little mechanism or there's just a bit of geometric randomness being added. All right, and we are able to get a, um, a, um, a theorem here, a regret bound. Uh, if they're in players and in arms, um, and for a value P between zero and one, the, there's a notion of pessimal stable regret here. So, you know, there's optimal and pessimal. Um, so of the attainable arms, I, I'm guaranteed to get the worst among my attainable arms. Um, that's what the notion of a pessimal is here. And of course, it's the stable regret. It's relative to Gail Shapley. Uh, so the, the pessimal stable uh, regret of arm uh, of player I satisfies uh, this bound here. So it's, uh, it's polylogarithmic and it's got an interesting and funny exponential factor in there, which would be lovely to try to remove. Um, but it's in there kind of for a for reason. And then we have again our, our uh, nice interpretable gap in the denominator. Um, so we can get rid of that quadratic on the logarithm uh, under certain assumptions. So for example, if all arms have the same preferences over all players, it turns out that you get just a, just a pure logarithm. Okay, so these are all upper bounds, uh, no lower bounds as of yet, and, and you know, not entire clarity about what's going to kind of be the best rate and what you can get here. Um, but anyway, uh, that's where we're at with the problem. Um, all right, so let me finish up. Um, I'm going to have two finishing up slides, one from me and one from Costas. So... Um, this is mine, which is just kind of go back up to the very top level. You know, machine learning, a lot of progress, but really uh, kind of overly focused, in my view, on pattern recognition over the last few years. Uh, Grady descent and labeled data and patterns and even unlabeled data, but just still finding patterns. And uh, it's become a commodity and it's widely used, but it's widely misused too, because people aren't thinking about the consequences of the decisions based on these kind of systems. And you know, instead of just saying, hey, we're not thinking enough about it, we should work more on it. Um, we already been working on this and we have a lot to say about decision-making, but we got to kind of step forward and say, well, we're gonna, we know how to talk about decision-making, you know, false discovery rates, microeconomic principles, you know, regret and so on and so forth. Um, but we got to talk about it in these high stakes situations and talk about really doing it in the real world at real scale and particularly bringing in market mechanisms. Um, okay, actually, that's the last slide I had. So I am done, and uh, if there's time for questions, or I don't know how you're running it. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. So we have we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, while while people are working out how to use the Q and A feature, let let me ask. Um, your your learning matching markets here has this asymmetry between between agents and arms, right? The agents don't know the preference over the arms. Yeah. The arms know the restaurants know in advance who's going to pay up. Um, you know, what do you know if both have uncertainty? Do, do we uh, yeah, we don't know. I mean, the, there, there's a natural symmetry in the problem formulation. In the actual analysis we've done, it's not so symmetric. We're, really, it's focused on the bandit side. You know, the agents are learning and the arms are not learning in the current setup. So they have unknown preferences, but they're not being learned. And so I think, uh, you know, obvious next steps are to have the agents, sorry, the, um, the right-hand side of the market also doing the learning and actually restore a little bit of the symmetry. It's much harder. Um, but, you know, another one of the kind of super interesting problems on the list of things to work on. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Mike. I have a question for Mike as well. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, would it make some sense to give the arms some way to... They might have preferences, but you might prefer uh, Piotr over me, but I'm willing to pay more for the restaurant. So you say, damn, I have to serve Christian. Yeah. Yeah, no, great question. Um, so first of all, um, in an example like that, you can sort of see there's a real asymmetry that we kind of like it when the arms, uh, sorry, when the, the players uh, share information, you know, but this is a good restaurant, you should all go there. We don't so much like it when the restaurants share information 
it started to get into privacy issues and how, how come you pick those guys versus these, there's legal issues. So, you know, it's, it's interestingly different there. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that you're bringing in prices and auctions and bids and all that. And I totally want to do that and agree you need to do that. Um, but it really complicates the situation. Um, you know, it, it, it conceptually could, it, it could make the situation simpler, but it, it, it's, uh, it's a matching market with prices and uh, very much more uh, complicated piece of mathematics. Um, and so we didn't kind of go there as our first step, but I, I totally agree. I mean, I really do like to have this concrete model in mind though. I walk into, uh, you know, I, I'm in Shanghai, I'm walking around, I got my cell phone out. I push a button and say, I want dinner. And just like the Uber kind of market, I want then the restaurants around to kind of respond to that in some sense, right? And I want to then be able to easily, you know, in some sense, make a bid or have them make a bid for me. So I kind of like the restaurants to say, hey, we've, we're looking at you, you're really relevant, you like our kind of food, you know, that's the recommendation part. And um, we're gonna make a bid, you know, if you come for the next 10 minutes, we'll make you a 5% discount. And, um, mm -hmm. and I look at my best offer and I accept one. And uh, so, yeah, I'd like to have a notion of au auctions and bids and all that in a situation like that, but. Um, um, I see, yeah. so you're thinking of some we restaurants make the bids. We should stop it there, Christian, we're, we're out of time. Yeah. Thanks yeah. very much. Mike, appreciate okay. it. So, All right, you bet. Thank fantastic. You. So um, our, our next speaker is uh, Philippe Rigolet. Um, Philippe's a professor in mathematics at MIT. Um, uh, he's